And oh. uh, so Richard, go ahead and make the introduction. And how, how is the sound? Um, people getting feedback? It's good. It's good. <laughs> All right. It's good. Yes, when Joey starts speaking, okay. then I'm gonna mute everyone. Okay. All right. Okay, here we go. Speaking. Go ahead. Joey Santor is an amazing, riotous, incredibly mm -hmm. informative, potty mm -hmm. mouth. I love it. Self-taught botanist, YouTube oh, phenom, and a new father of a one-year-old daughter named Encelia. Yes, in the Daisy family plant. He is erudite, easy on the eyes. He even has a ruler tattooed on his finger for measuring plants with a mellifluous voice and a Chicago accent. His salty language uh, highlights everything. He is a promoter of Patreon, which is a membership platform that provides business tools for content creators and artists to run subscription service. Look it up. It's spelled B-A-T-R-E-O-N. Uh, Joey grew up in Chicago and he moved to California in the year 2000. He dropped out of college, did odd jobs, was in the military, rode the rails for two years around the country, and then spent 13 years, correct me if I'm wrong, Joey, spent 13 years as a brake man and locomotive driver for getting his license. Yeah, that's good, yeah. Yeah, 13 he decided years. to settle down in Oakland and has made hundreds of YouTube videos, 451 to be exact, under the name Crime Pays But Botany Doesn't. And he has interviewed many very well-known botanists, including Peter Raven of the Missouri Botanic Garden. He has traveled the world making videos the various lengths, like for in the Atacama Desert, Pima County, Arizona, New Caledonia, Southern New Mexico, Western Australia, Hispaniola, Hispaniola, Mexico, Zambia, and the list goes on. His video titles <laughs> uh, include The Plant Ecology of Concrete, Garbage, and Urine, the Ethnomycology of Ugly Landscaping, Indoor Greenhouse Tutorial to Prevent Homicide, and The Filthiest Flower in All the Land. What can I say? He is a pantomath. Among his many accomplishments, he's also an artist. He drew me last year when I didn't know who he was. Oh, you still got it. Oh. He captured my likeness there. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Uh, and he gave it to me as a, as a present. He does do portraits and, and art for other people. I have the extreme pleasure of introducing Joey Santor. Thank you, Joey. Hello. Thank you. Hello. I'm so, it makes me happy to see you still got that drawing. I certainly I wasn't do. sure you were going to keep it when I came in and gave it to you. You were like, what is I know. this? I told you that I don't especially like port. I don't even like to look at myself in the mirror. Wait, uh, to start off, okay, I just wanted to, I, I was going to share with uh, with you guys Western Australia and Chile and something else, but I think I'm just going to do Dominican Republic, oh. the cloud forest of the, of the Dominican Republic sure. and, uh, and Chile, because there's a lot of really... Really interesting stuff in the Dominican, on Hispaniola in the Caribbean. These cloud forests are incredible, and a lot of the stuff that grows there would probably grow really well in uh, the coastal California climate as well, because it's you know it's I mean it's the Caribbean, it's the, the subtropics, but uh, it's like seven thousand feet uh, elevation. So there's incredible salvias, incredible lobelias. Both of which I got germinating in this little tub next to me. Uh, I brought seed back, tried to get it around, get these things in horticulture because horticulture is kind of a way to preserve a lot of stuff. But uh, right here, I got a uh, Amborella trichopoda, just getting its first big leaf. Wanted to share with everybody because I might end up, I'll probably end up killing it in the next uh, year. They're very finicky, but there you go. Uh, that's about a year old. I just sow the seed and wait for them to uh, come up. So. Um, 
Anyway, we got a nice presentation here for you. And uh, if everyone's ready, I'll start. We are. We okay. are. We are. Right. Host, host disabled screen sharing. No, no, no. Let's see. Okay. Uh, screen share. <laughs> I forget how they did it. I, I just did like four presentations and this would happen. Oh, here we go. Oh, here we go. Oh, cool. Host disabled participant screen sharing. Let me see, how do you share screen? I push the, the bottom. Upward arrow to the right of the screen. Hmm. It says you got to uh, click the upward arrow to the right of share screen, then select multiple participants can share simultaneously. No, we don't. We, oh, we don't want multiple participants to share. That's not it. Yeah, that's not. That's not it. Hmm. Okay, so Joey, once more, try to share. Uh, it's still saying host disabled participant screen sharing. Excuse me, can everybody mute themselves? There's a lot of background noise. Okay, allow participants to share. I think you're allowed to share now, Joey. Yeah, there we go. Okay. All right. So here we go, and uh, let's try. There we go. Can everybody see that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Made a nice little title page. Starting off, so here's, here's uh, of course, Hispaniola. Here's Dominican Republic. Here's Haiti. Uh, the route I took, I was mostly west of uh, of the border of this uh, image right here. So it's the, this is the Cordillera Central. You got like seven mountain ranges here, all trending west, northwest to southeast, uh, due to uh, the geology of the area, the plate tectonics. There's, you know, it's just kind of like a a clusterfuck of plate tectonics. If anybody minds the swearing, let me know, and I'll try to uh, clean it up. But I'm just going to talk the way I talk. So. We st I started off here, this area right here is below sea level, uh, which is really uh, intriguing. And then we went up to the Sierra de Bajaruco and uh, saw a bunch of interesting stuff there, cool lobelias, cool salvias, right near the border with Haiti, followed this road down, and then I uh, went to the Cordillera Central. So starting off, we were right here near Lago, Lago Enriquillo. There's American crocodiles there. It's all below sea level. And all the geology there is an ancient reef, probably few million years old um yeah really really wild shit and there's a bunch of uh, endemic iguanas there too so just to start off in the lowlands because some of these cacti were too cool not to share there's milo cactus peter nalensis you of course they got that cephalium which is basically a a way to uh maximize the efficiency of flowering uh because you know in order to flower a cacti i need to produce new aerials uh, which can be expensive to do if you live in a, a very hot, dry area. Now, this the Dominican Republic to the northeast gets a lot of rain, but this is in the rain shadow. This is to the southwest. The rains come from the east. Uh, looking back at that map, the rain comes from over here. So everything over here is super dry. That's why you get all these cool cacti. So there's Milo cactus, Peter, Peter Nalensis. They get poached pretty bad because uh, I think they 
there's some weird, you know, traditional medicine thing saying they cure urinary tract infections or <laughs> I think they actually give you kidney stones because they've got the calcium oxide. But so there's the habitat. Stenocereus fimbriatus back here. Don't worry, the cacti's not gonna last too long. I just, I'm really into it, so I wanted to share it. Here's uh, the habitat that these rare iguanas live in, two species, uh, really bizarre. And this tree cactus, this tree prickly pear is really important to them. It's an endemic to the island Consolea moniliformis. Um, there's one of the flowers of it. These things are incredible, but I guess the iguanas can actually climb them. Uh, they eat the fruits. They uh, believe they eat some of the pads. The pads, believe it or not, are not that spiny. It's just the trunks. You know, when they get a certain height, they're not that spiny. But here you can see they're just covered. And we saw iguanas all over here just running around. There's one of them, it's like Clara Recordii. I told him he looked like Mitch McConnell because he's got that kind of like five, five uh, chin thing going on. Um, but uh, you can see the, the substrate here. I mean, they live in these little holes and they just scurry into them. It's hilarious. They run so fast. And these are just these ancient reef that they live on. It was incredible. I mean, oh, you know, lithified corals. There's another uh, specimen of that tree. All kinds of cool stuff growing around here, but we're not going to get into that because we're low on time and I talk too much anyway. So anyway, moving away from there, this is more inland, but still relatively low elevation, low elevation, Anastrophia picardae, which is a very strange member of the sunflower family. It's in that mutisioid subfamily that uh, is mostly in South America, but look at these. They only grow on this, uh, this limestone. So the surrounding woodland, there were none of these. They only grow on these limestone outcrops. So ecologically, they're pretty cool. This species was previously only known from Haiti. And then it was found in the DR maybe 10 or 20 years ago. There's that weird capitulum with those bilabiate uh, corolla florets. Ooh, it's white woolly leaves. Just a fucking incredible plant. So going up, that's it with the low elevations. So this is at about 7,000 feet. The climate here paralleled that of San Francisco. It wasn't too hot, it wasn't too cold. It reminded me of being in San Francisco Botanical Garden. This is agave intermixta. Uh, and I got seeds of these, and I'm assuming this is an agave that would do really good in the coastal California climate. Um, what they're growing on here is a limestone karst. Beneath all this, this duff is basically it's like dog tooth cars. That's the name for it, dog tooth cars. It's so sharp and rigid. I mean, if you were to try to work on the base, walk on the base rock here in just bare feet, you wouldn't be able to move. It's incredibly painful. It, the way it reacts with the, the rain in this subtropical climate just creates these razor sharp um, textures to it. But you can see this is Pinus occidentalis, uh, the endemic pine on these highlands here. And then uh, agave intermixta. There was also a silk tassel, a species of garia that was really common here. There was a species of baccarus, coyote bush, that was really common here. This agave was really uh, blowing my mind, though. It's a, it's a, I believe it's a, is it a lionia or a garia in the background? I believe this is the garia, garia fadinii. Made up, made it. So I drove this road. It took to get up here. It was the road was super beat up. Um, I was in a four wheel drive. Uh, Nissan um, that smelled like hell. It smelled like off-gassing plastic and, you know, just diesel, but it did the job. It got me up here. It was a really slow crawl because the road was so bad, but got up and then here's a, this is that Garia again. I'll get up close shots and um, just an incredible forest, man. And, you know, of course, across the border in Haiti, most of this forest is denuded already. It's gone. These really white woolly plants here were a member of the Senecio tribe of uh, the composite family in the genus Elecmania that was named after a, a famous botanist who did, you know, tens of thousands of uh, voucher specimens that he collected here called Eric, Eric Ekman. He was Swedish. He died in his early 40s from malaria, but he did a shit ton of work in Cuba and the Dominican Republic and Haiti. So here's that garia. You can see glabrous up top, real smooth because it rains so much here. And then under, on the undersides, on those abaxial surfaces, very woolly, uh, volutinous, like velvet. Here's a male, nice up close money shot. You can get banned for the internet from uh, showing stuff like this. Wind pollinated, of course. So those anthers just dehiss and they were just, 
just pollen going everywhere. Now we're getting into some of these salvias, man. This uh, the salvias here. I wasn't. I didn't know how species rich they were for salvias. These things are incredible. I wish I would have gotten seed of this. I didn't. Um, this is salvia buchii, and it was probably this is like six thousand feet. Just growing on the side of the road. It's of course super white, uh, uh, velvety undersides, and then. Not as, uh, not as hairy up top, but those flowers, those verticillasters are incredible. This was one of my favorites by far, this lobelia. This is like a vining lobelia. Um, and I got seed of it, they just germinated actually. They're incredibly tiny, like lobelia seeds tend to be, seedlings tend to be, I hope I can keep them alive. Um, Cause I would love to see this in horticulture, man. This thing was, I mean, it probably, re it, it requires a lot of moisture but the temperature, especially like coastal California, is just right for this. So hummingbird pollinated, obviously, this thing has got this kind of scandent vining habit, uh, just, just draped over trees. It was really common, too, on the island, not just in this cloud forest, but I mean, god damn, the color is just, of course, there's that fused anther tube. This is in the female phase, and uh, see, I think this one, like this flower is in the male phase. So, you know, lobelias are protandrous. They're they present pollen first, pushing it out of that fused anther tube. And then when, they're, when they present all the pollen, that style comes out and is receptive to pollen. There's that style and stigma. Oh, look at that. God damn it. This in, oh, five fused petals at the base. Here's the calyx. I was in love with this plant, man. I, I love this plant so much. Got to get it into cultivation. I got to share this with people. And then moving on, another salvia, salvia foveolata. You can see the corolla here is fuzzy, of course. I, I, you know, I should have dissected this thing because salvias, of course, have those cool lever mechanisms so that when a hummingbird, you know, sticks its uh, beak in there, it daps down with the, these stamens. Um, lots of hummingbirds on the island, lots of cool birds, period. There was one bird, uh, what was it called? Rufus throated solitaire that sounded like a rusty playground swing and it was everywhere, but it was, it was this really peaceful uh, sound. I say rusty playground swing, just, you know, breaking balls. The thing sounded really, really lovely. Really lovely bird. And you're in these desolate forests and everything's wet and there's sphagnum moss on the ground, these tall pines, you're like 6,000 feet. And you hear this really slow melancholy, uh, it's not a chirping, I don't know what you would call it. It's, you know, really long and drawn out. Oh my God, Meconia ferruginea. So I, I didn't know much about Melastomataceae. I only knew, you know, Tibuccinia, which you see in a lot of, you know, gardens in Berkeley. Uh, this family uh, is enormous and it's very species rich on the island. There's been a ton of diversification. There's probably, Christ, I don't know, 90 species of Melastomes. Meconia, of course, is a huge genus. It's uh, paraphyletic. So it, there's some taxonomic work to do on there. Well, I'm trying to do a podcast with this guy He's a free, like we're kind of friends. He studies this group, but uh, he's been busy as hell. I can't get him in. Look at these anthers. What is going on? God, they're weird. So they're, a lot of these are buzz pollinated. Uh, they don't produce nectar. They just produce pollen as a reward, but just really, really weird uh, anther morphology. And that's what I love doing. I love getting up with the fucking 105 millimeter lens and really getting in there and seeing what's going on. Because every flower is like a puzzle. Every flower will tell you something about, if you look hard enough, there's clues to its ecology, its evolution. Like, how did this evolve, man? Some of, the, some of these are incredible. You go to like Colombia or Brazil, some of the melastomes are incredible there. All the, all the scales. And of course, that sub-parallel venation, like you see in Tibuccinia, you can see it right here. Fuzzy as hell on the underside of that leaf, but glabrous up top. See all the scales. Then here's that Alecmania. This is a, so this is a basically a senecio, but it's this whole genus. It's got I, I forget how many species in it, but these there's the this Alecmania buchii. There was Alecmania hadiensis, which is a really cool scanded one that like leaned on other plants, but was super white. Um, but look at this. I mean, this look at the wool. It looks like like a someone threw their teepee on this. You know, just so woolly, so white. It looks like a damn Q-tip, and you could kind of like peel it off with thumb too and these leaves were really leathery really coriaceous and you, you can see here it was getting dark so i'd use the flash it's kind of a shitty photo but 
and there's that back wrist down there. <laughs> Minus oxygen and This is like 7,000 feet. Fuchsia. Few fuchsias there too, of course, because you got hummers. Uh, so, uh, you know, hummer pollination for most of the fuchsias. Ona Gracie, evening primrose family. This is fuchsia pringshimei. Look at how dense this is. It was just so dense, so thick, and no one around, just so desolate up there. Odontosauria aculeata, really cool. I've seen Odontosaurias before. They're always impressive ferns. They're just, I saw one in, uh, in the Sierra Mije, Oaxaca once. That's how I got turned on to this genus and learned how fucking cool they are. But uh, see, there's the sori under there. Uh, but this one has thorns and this was really common too. Red stem thorns. There was another species of Odontosauria I saw on the island uh, as well in the Cordillera Central. And then this guy, Salvia brachyloba. Ah, so this again is on that, that karst. This was a beautiful morning. I, I didn't know where to sleep. There was nowhere to, you know, obviously you're the it's middle of nowhere, man. You're right near the Haitian border. And so they got these every, you know, 15 miles or so, 15 kilometers, they got these old beat up, uh, I don't know if they're stations or what, but it's like a, basically a concrete building. I didn't sleep in it. I just rolled out, had my sleeping bag rolled out on the pine duff. Um, and it smelled incredible. There was trogans. I saw one of the trogans, those cool birds, a Hispaniola and trogan. That rufous throated solitaire, and I'm not much of a bird guy. I like him, I just don't know much about him, but I know this thing because it sounded so fucking incredible. Up on the standing on top of this, this, this karstic uh, formation that was covered in, there was a species of ilex, there was the, the salvia, there was the elegmania everywhere, pinus occidentalis, just the most pleasant forest. Felt like the Mendocino coast, and this solitaire was just going off. It's really like this really long, uh, it sounded like a rusty playground swing, kind of like a more pleasant version of a rusty playground swing. So anyway, this, I saw this, this salvia, and I just was taken by it. I had to get a uh, seed of it. And so I did, and they're coming up gangbusters. Now I gave some seed to a friend in Texas, gave some seed to a friend in Eureka. So hopefully there'll be more of this because people need to be growing it. Such a beautiful species. Rondoletia carnea. Rubiaceae. So this is a, in the coffee family. You can see, look, it's got these, these curled in leaves again, probably to shed uh, all the rain. And of course, since it still can get a little hot, it's got the velvet on the underside. Hummingbird pollinated, obviously, five fused petals. And this thing, as you can see here, they got upwards of like 12 feet tall, but they still had those opposite leaves and those interpetular stipules uh, of uh, the coffee family of Rubiaceae. But I, if, Fell in love with this thing too. Wish I would have gotten some seeds. This thing was weird. This was cool. So this is, you know, you know, uh, what is the wax myrtle we get in California? You get another species of wax myrtle in the southeast Louisiana swamps. That the, the formerly in the genus Mirica. I guess they've all been changed to Morella now. So I didn't read the paper on it, but trying to keep up with the taxonomy, I figured, what the fuck, I'll name this Morella too. But this was formerly Mirica Picardae. The Miracaceae in the order of oaks, Fagales, wind pollinated like so many members of that whole order. Um, and here's the flowers. These are the, uh, these were, this is a male. Um, and same thing, you just tap this and this clouds of pollen will come up. And it wasn't a very tall shrub, maybe four or five feet tall, but you could see it coming up with that agave intermixta. And then there was a little ilex down here. And then there was that salvia all around here. Uh, and some cool grasses too, some cool endemic grasses. And again, where the rock was exposed, it was that razor sharp dog tooth karst, the limestone that apparently for whatever reason just weathers really easily. Nice up close to the cones again, or the uh, flowers, excuse me. Here's that Alecmania again. There was a Lyonia here too. Lyonia of course is, we don't get Lyonia out west, it's uh, Ericaceae, the blueberry family. Uh, there was Lyonia here, tons of that Meconia. But this thing, I was just, I was taking it how woolly that thing is. Like, how does, how does it evolve? Like, why? What, what selective pressures selected for leaves that look like goddamn Q-tips? I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. But it's all, you'll notice it's only really the new leaves. Like, when the older leaves don't have it, it just gets blown off or weathered off or what, so. Wasn't flowering, unfortunately, but yellow, senecio-like flowers when it does. Here is that forest. You got Cladonia lichen on the ground. 
I mean, it, it looks like, uh, you know, coastal Sonoma or coastal Mendocino. I mean, look at how just so much vapor, so much water vapor and fog in the air right here. These forests were so pleasant and I'd love to see the mushrooms that come up uh, after a good rain. Growing nearby that Alecmania, here's this Maconia luteola melastomataceae again. Uh, brought back some of these. Uh, haven't germinated them yet, sent some to a friend. But I'm guessing, again, with all these, this, they would do well, like in Striving Arboretum in San Francisco. Just the climate is so similar. Granted, I was there in February. I don't know how hot it gets in like, uh, you know, July. But again, it's 7,500 feet up. I assume it doesn't get that hot. Another lobelia, this had time. These flowers were actually remarkably small. Lobelia salicina. There's that pollen, that anther tube. The pollen presenter hasn't come out yet. Five fused petals. This thing was a stunner, man. Some of them had that uh, red coloration on them. Gesneria, tons of Gesneria. It's ton of Gesneria ACA. And this was actually in a serpentine spot. There's serpentine uh, on Hispaniola, just like there's serpentine on Cuba because there's subduction zones nearby. So, uh, you know, that peridotite got metamorphosed and then uplifted. That Just like we get, I mean, there were parts where the rock looked just like you'd see in Trinity County, you know? So this was growing out of a little uh, rock crevice above this really pretty creek. This is at a lower elevation. This is maybe... 2,000 feet, 3,000 feet. Cool epiphytic uh, Gizneriae, Columnia domingensis, Gizneriae. Look at that calyx, Jesus Christ. Is there a why, are those, why are those spikes? Here's the habitat. Just kind of dangling off the side of a, side of a, a wall, off the side of a road right there. Rene Almia jamaicensis, one of the gingers, endemic ginger. Well, not endemic, endemic to the uh, Antilles, to the uh, Caribbean. This is about probably 4,000 feet. Here's that Elecmania barahonensis. Again, this is uh, 7,000 feet. This is back in that agave intermixed uh, Pinus occidentalis forest, that pine forest. Again, that wool. Again with the wool. Corella Riza Ekmanii. This was the first photograph uh, in the wild that's been taken of this plant. It was known only from herbarium specimens. Unfortunately, I wasn't there at the right time uh, to get it in flower. That would have been in January. This was I was there in February, but uh, still cool. A mycoheterotrophic plant. So this thing is parasitizing fungus that is uh, symbiotic with these pines in the background. Agave intermixed again. So this is now, uh, we're heading into the Cordillera Central. These things were incredible. This is this is probably 6,000 feet up. You can in see all the, the all the fog and all the water vapor in the sky. And these things were just covered in giant bumblebees and all kinds of cool pollinators. There's those leaf blades. Uh, got some seed of this, mail it to a friend who grows agaves. And, you know, like I said, this thing would probably do really, really well in coastal California. Ardizia species, Primulaceae. This is back at that serpentine spot. I, this is, <laughs> no one knew what species it was. I went to the herbarium afterwards at the uh, National Botanic Garden. I don't think the guy even, he knew everything, but I think this is one he did not know. But it's Ardizia, Primulaceae. So it's a tree primrose. Really cool flowers on this thing. Boom. Five stamens, five petals, little style in there. Cocothrinax argentia. This looks like, eh, hey, whatever. It's a palm. You flip it over and it's got this silver underside to it. Pretty wild. And uh, one of the last few pics I'll show from that lowland serpentine soil spot, Exosthema spinosum from the coffee family, from the Rubiaceae. Those little pendant flowers looking like they're, uh, looks to be hummingbird pollinated. Like so many things of the, uh, so many plants of the neotropics. So now we're going up into the cloud forest, the Cordillera Central, a species of St. John's wort. Eh, nice to see, don't know which one. There's like 11 there, uh, just kind of showing it to give you an idea of what was growing here. So this is about 5,000 feet. Now we're not on uh, limestone anymore. We're not on serpentine. This was like some weird laterite 
the soils in the Cordillera Central are lots of volcanics and uh, some intrusive igneous rocks too, some granites and stuff. This was pretty cool to see a blueberry, an endemic blueberry, Vaccinium racemosum. Oh, it's going to be that interesting. This is the show. <laughs> Someone's displeased. Uh, anyway, so there's that flower. This was just, uh, yeah, so again, coriaceous leaves, really leathery, just uh, high petals, just, you know, of course you got those inverted anthers. This thing was pretty wild. I, of course, I couldn't find any of the, the berries and fruit, so I don't know what it tasted like. But uh, the habitat just got more incredible. So this is a, a Cladonia of some kind, some sort of weird lichen that was just, yeah, I don't know. Oh, yeah, so we're up to 630. It's 632, but he wasn't even introduced. The shirt was 630. Okay. Yeah. Joey, oh. yeah. Joey can you hear me? Yeah. There's, there's a call from the audience to mute the audience. So I'm going to mute them and then unmute you. Okay. They're making too much noise. Okay. Okay. Um, so now you can unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I just, I just heard somebody complaining about something. Okay. <laughs> okay. You can, okay. You, okay. Anyway. Okay. So here we go. Delo, so now this is, we're getting into the cloud force. There's, uh, the cloud force of the Cordillera Central, the Central Mountain Range. Uh, there's an endemic magnolia that grows here. There are there were so there's so many endemics. I think there's like 1,500 endemic plants in the Dominican Republic. Uh, and uh, here's one of the uh, orchids. I don't believe this was endemic though, but this is Dillomylus montana. Just a nice epiphytic orchid in an extremely wet forest. This thing was pretty wild. It, an epiphytic pinguicula. So it's a carnivorous plant. You can see it traps insects on these leaf blades right here in these little rosettes. And um, it's got a couple already digested right there, but it was just growing uh, as an epiphyte. You know, I think there's only two or three species of pinguicula that do that. Wish I could have caught it in flower. It's got white flowers when it does bloom, but this is pretty rare too. They're, um, I believe they're poached pretty heavily. There's the habitat. You can see there's Pinguicula up there and then Guzmania, the bromeliad up there. Just a super wet forest, just dripping. Moss on everything. There's that nice Guzmania, some fern I never identified. And uh, the endemic Magnolia ovata. Where was this? Wait, maybe it wasn't. Let me see what the species was, just to check. I didn't catch it in flower, but uh, it's endemic to the DR. Um, and you can see it's got that indumentum on the undersides of the uh, the leaves right there. So it's got like a velvet on the underside of the leaves and a uh, super glabrous up top to shed water. And then of course there's those ripe, those ripe infructescences. Oh, palescence, yeah, excuse me. I confused it with the vanifoli. Magnolia palescence. These got about, I don't know, 30 feet tall and they grew. They grew only at about 5,000 feet uh, and above, but not above 7,000 feet. The tallest peak in the Dominican is 10,000 feet. Look at that silvery foliage, though. And there's the habitat, just really thick forest. There was a species of uh, uh, Schefflera there, and there was another species of, uh, what was it? Um, it was an Aureliaceae, I forget. Margravia rubra, Margraviaceae. So these are these are cool. This whole genus is does the shingle leaf climbing thing where they kind of grow up pressed when they're young, uh, get up against the tree, and then eventually with their mature leaves, they, they spread out, they get bigger, and then didn't catch it in flower, unfortunately, but here's the fruits. And this thing it was just, it ended up looking just like it's just a vine that grows in these trees, but it's in the order of blueberries. So, so now we're at the 6,000 feet. Uh, in the central Cordillera, here's uh, Salvia turchimii. These giant bracts subtending every flower. Hummer, hummingbird pollinated, obviously. Cordia lima growing close by. So this is Boraginaceae. I don't know if anybody here knows the genus Cordia. You get them in uh, South Texas, you get them in Mexico. 
a lot, but this thing is just covered. Look at all those hairs and scales. And these relatively small flowers with five fused petals. So, and here was a, a tongue fern, really cool tongue fern I saw as I headed up to these pine savannas up at 8,000 feet. This is a, a lapo, species of a lapo blossom. Almost got a blue color to it, glabrous, kind of shed to shed the rain and then super velvety uh, on the inner side, all those scales. There you go. That was nice too. Just keep it a real massive garbage dump and people were picking through it. Uh, yeah, kind of a bummer, but so it goes where we go. Okay, moving up from that, Meconia lanceolatus, another one of those cool melastomes. Beetles were going nuts on this thing. You can see all the scales and all the velvet. Uh, this was a tree to about 10 feet. It was growing in these Pinus occidentalis forests, but there was Tillandsias up there, the hummingbird pollinated Tillandsias with these huge pendant inflorescences, these pink inflorescences. So now we're getting up to Danthonia domingensis. So Danthonia domingensis is a species of, of bunch grass, and it's it's kind of like the base of the ecosystems up here. They they are so they're so rooted into this soil and they hold, help retain so much water. And they even beneath these bunch grasses, you've got this whole community of mosses and weird lycophytes and other stuff that, uh, that grow beneath them. So here's what they look like. You can see still lots of pines up there. This is about 75, 8,000 feet, 7,500, 8,000 feet. So, and it's, it's looks flat here, but it's not. It's like this lumpy soil, really easy to probably break your ankle. So one of the species of lycophytes grown beneath it, you can see right here, Diphasiastrum facetii. Tons of the soil here is so wet too. So this Danthonia helps retain all the moisture and the, the soil here is super acidic. You know, kind of reminded me of like a bog you'd see in the Southeast. Now it's starting to get interesting. So here's one of those species of Lyonias, uh, Lyonia heptamera, Ericaceae. All the usni on everything. And here's the flowers, those ursulate ericoid flowers of that uh, Lyonia. Just covered in uh, orange scales too, which is kind of weird. Ten anthers, ten stamens inside with those inverted anthers. And that's an endemic. And then, of course, there's just a nice uh, view of that. Uh, of that habitat. But interestingly too, up top, at the top of some of these pines was a species of tropical mistletoe. Here's, a, here's Baccarus, coyote bush, Baccarus mercenites, super glandular, smelled really good, just like our native California coyote bush. And here's that uh, tropical mis mistletoe, Dendropemon pycnophilus, which was just covered in that uh, Ustia and Cladonia and all kinds of weird lichens, you know, four or five different species at least. Flowers weren't open yet on it, but uh, hummingbird pollinated, obviously. So anyway, moving on to Chile on the other side of the equator, uh, we'll start uh, with the Chilean Altiplano, the most extensive area of high plateau on earth outside Tagbet. Just to give you an idea of uh, where we are. So we started off here near Arica, way up in the north, Here's the border with Peru. Here's the border with Bolivia. And uh, we basically followed down this way and then went inland along the coast for a while and then came back to the high Andes uh, near Santiago. So um, look at all the pimply vol volcanic activity right there. So here's Arica, flew into Arica and then drove up. So this is one of the first plants we encountered. It was barren for like the first six, 7,000 feet. This is the Loisia tarapacana, verbenaceae, and they make a, uh, the locals make a really pleasant smelling tea out of this, and they'll mix it with coca leaves, you know, to keep uh, tourists from puking or passing out from the uh, extremely high elevation. Dunalia spinosa, another cool uh, hummingbird pollinated nightshade with these pendant flowers. See the branches terminate in spines. So this is at like, I don't know, probably 9,000 feet right now. Felt kind of like Northern Nevada, even though it was 18 degrees latitude. Polylepis rugulosa, rose family, rosaceae. Cool genus of these high growing uh, 
Andean roses, rose trees. There's the flower covered in wool. And there's that thick bark, probably to insulate against uh, cool temperatures. The Rasa operculata malvesi. There's that androphore. It's again, covered in scales and trichomes. So I got really quick, if you guys want to tell me what you want, so I'm not boring you to tears. I got, this is Northern Chile, and then I got, you know, Central Chile with the Rosalate violets and stuff. If you guys want to see that instead, we can skip ahead to that and come back to this. Just let me know. If anybody uh, wants to speak up, speak up or forever hold your peace. Chukiraga spinosa. So the, there's this Chukiraga is this genus of like, I call them dinosaur sunflowers. These really weird old, uh, one of the earlier branching lineages of the sunflower family. Hummingbird pollinated, obviously, covered in wool. And uh, of course, they're in the Barnadesia subfamily. So they've got these spines. And this, this thing was everywhere too, really uh, ubiquitous up top. Look at all the hairs. Bomaria involucrosa from the Elstromariaceae in the lily uh, order. This thing was like six feet tall and pendant flowers, just incredible plant. I would love to see this in cultivation down here too. And that was the first observation of it in Chile. It's mostly Peruvian. Growing nearby was a Coriocactus brevis stylus. Again, still, this is still 9,000 feet up. So moving on up, now we're at 13,000 feet. You can see there's not a lot of trees. We're too high. It's a lot of stuff stays close to the ground. Uh, like this uh, Pycnophyllum tetraspicum, Caryophyllaceae. This just looking like little green carpets right here at the foot of these bunch grasses. There's the flowers. And of course, Azarella compacta, one of the most famous plants from South America, carrot family. It's a really bizarre looking matted carrot. Everything here grows matted and close to the ground because of course it's so high up. If you stand up, you get blown over or uh, you know fried in the sun or too cold. So fried with the ultraviolet, excuse me. So everything stays close to the ground where it's warmer and avoids the wind and uh, has been evolutionarily selected for. You can see this azarella is just everywhere. And that is about probably a foot, uh, a foot deep of, of root and woody tissue. Up close to the flowers, little leaf rosettes, sessile flowers, sessile umbels. And these things bled resin too, which was interesting. More pics of the habitat, all volcanic. See the resin right there, smelled like parsley, a little bit like carrots. Bubbling up right there. So something picked at it or what? I don't know, maybe a biscacha picked at it. Weird chinchilloid bastards. Peristrephia, a juniper-like member of the sunflower family. I like seeing this shit. I like seeing what evolution has done. I like seeing the endless forms, most beautiful, all the variations on a the theme. Really weird shit. Really weird shit up here at 13,500 feet, as you would expect. There's been a lot of selective pressure to, you know, cause these weird forms to evolve. Looking much different from their lowland... Uh, counterparts. More azarella, more pycnophyllum right there. Wasn't able to, I don't think I wasn't interested in that bunch grass. I wish I can, kind of wish I would have been. Here's what azarella looks like before it forms a mat. More open leaves, larger leaves. Azarella and pycnophyllum living together, sharing the same rock. Isn't that cute? Here we go, vicuñas. Relatives of camels, and of course, uh, I think these were the wild uh, progenitors to the uh, domesticated llama. Flamingos too, still up at 13,000 feet, tons of volcanic activity, tons of cinder cones everywhere and little lava piles. Rel relatively tolerant to people. And here we are at 15,000 feet, and this is where shit got really weird. This is where we started to see some really bizarre plants, uh, like I'm about to show you. And there's a huge volcano up uh, to the right here. There you go. You can just see subsequent lava flows, andesitic lava. 
So this is the highest growing tree, which is technically a tree uh, in the world. This is Polylepis tarapacana. And uh, you can see it's just got this whole little community that kind of surrounds it right here. So it doesn't look like there's much here, but there was a ton of really weird, interesting stuff right here. And of course, these things topped out at like four feet, but they had, you know, thick trunks. They look more like shrubs here, but they're, again, that polylepis, that member of the rose family. So I started seeing this thing around and I was like, what, what is that? Looks really bizarre. You know, are those leaves? I guess technically they are. There's a better pic of uh, the habitat. This is a member of the composite family called Neodes right here, M-N-I-O-D-E-S. All this cool alpine stuff. Those rock garden aficionados would have a ball. And here's that plant flowering. So it's obviously a mallow. It's obviously Malvaceae. Here's these highly reduced leaves, sessile flowers. There's the androphore, just like a hibiscus would have with all those stamens around a central column. Uh, I was blown away at this, man. I mean, this is such extreme <laughs> evolutionary selection for an alpine plant. You got an alpine cotton up here. These leaves, if you could call them that, of course, they're covered in wool and they're, I mean, this thing was like an inch or two tall, if that. I mean, you could see, there it is. Growing with the bunch grasses, the andesite in the background, the polylepis darpacana in the background. And there's the general habitat. Azarella compacta, polylepis, and the rose family up there, and probably a ton of really good stuff that we didn't get a chance to go inspect because we were with somebody who was whining that uh, we were taking too long, who <laughs> was not a botanist. My friend, my friend, we went with my friend here and he runs like a tour, an ecotourism company. And he had this guy from Perth or something who was really, I don't know, he, we ended up having to disband uh, and leave him be four or five days later. But uh, anyway, yeah, this was incredible. So much incredible shit here. Like this other coyote bush, Bacris viscosissima. And I think this species was just described. I mean, there's totally species that have not been described yet. Pistillate flowers, Bacris, of course, either male or female, they're dioecious. This is, this is a female. But again, you've got this, you know, all the leaves close together and it's hugging this rock, hugging the ground because of uh, how high up. A semi uh, parasite, Neobarcia, no idea what species, no one. Uh, I asked, knew what species it was, oral bankasia, the paintbrush family, probably parasitizing some of the bunch grass nearby. And more of that azarella, you know, who knows how old that is? Thousand, 2000 years. And growing nearby was this uh, cactus, cumulopuncha ignescens, the opuncha subfamily. Just again, forming a little mat. That thing was forming a mat too, really cool. Just these like these giant, you know, mounds of a bunch of little individual uh, stems covered in spines. And of course, there's that polylepis tarapacana again. Same spot, we saw a little alpine mallow. Again, this is 15,000 feet up. That bark is beautiful. Look at that. There's the leaves, woolly, small. Everything just getting blasted by ultraviolet radiation here, of course, because the atmosphere is so thin. And we were coming, we were driving back from this spot and I saw this guy. I didn't get a shot of how he looked when I saw him, but he looked like Burt Reynolds on the bearskin rug. Like he was kind of like laying, that was hilarious, man. He was like, <laughs> just had a really weird posture. And then we rolled up, he got a little bashful, but uh, relative to chinchillas, a uh, viscacha, they call him hanging out on the side of the road in a little cavity. So next day, uh, we woke up, <clears throat> went to check out these hot springs and geysers. This is still 15,000 feet. It was freezing when we uh, got there. It was like 6 a.m. You got to get there in the morning to see them take off, to see them shoot off. Uh, there was not much growing here. There was some azarella growing on the hills over here. And then there was some uh, bunch grasses. But um, And this was really alkali water, too, very salty. And this was a little hot spring and we rolled up. There were tons of biscotches hanging out. They all ran and hid from us. But at this hot spring, this water was warm. Uh, saw a really cool lobelia, a matted lobelia, lobelia oligophylla. You can see some biscotcha turds right there. 
but uh, this thing is probably Christ half an inch across, if that. Still got your five pedals, still got your little anther tube, your little anther column. Also grown on the rocks was this Chiophora rosalata. So this is a relative of Mantzelia of our quote blazing stars in the lowest satiate. And it's just covered in these, these mean stingers. I mean, touching this thing was very painful, obviously. So I'm not sure what herbivore was around during its evolutionary past to select for these, these such a, a jacket of spines and stingers, but uh, it worked. The flowers are really incredible too. Five petals, but they're inflated. They're kind of hooded like that. Chiophora's got quite a few species in it in the Andes. Nice up close money shot of that uh, flower. And then back to the Azarella. These are some old boys. You can see this is somewhere in there. I take it it's a boulder it's growing on. That's why it's four feet off the ground, three feet off the ground. But, uh, you know, who knows how old? Who knows how many thousands of years that thing has uh, been doing its thing? They can live for two or 3,000 years. There's more of the habitat. This was a species of composite in the genus Peristrephia. Uh, familiar face, lupinous species, no idea which one. Didn't get it identified, but just grown on the side of the road. Again, incredibly high up on that altiplano. You can see those little woolly bracts. Chukiaraga spinosa again. There's hummingbirds up here. They're doing a lot of the pollinating. Most of the plants have been selected for this. There's a species uh, of Oreo cirrus, the old man cactus, that's got those pink tubular flowers because it's pollinated by hummingbirds. There's what the plant looks like. Look at that landscape too, all volcanic. All that oxidized the uh, andesite. Another species of Chukiaraga, Chukiaraga atacamensis. This is 15,000 feet uh, elevation. Few miles from the Bolivian border. In the background, you got Trichocereus atacamensis. And this is the native habitat of pampas grass, too. One species of pampas grass, which was interesting to see because you always see it, you know, as a really bad invasive in coastal California. But here's, <laughs> here's where some of it grows, of course, high in the Andes. Another species of Chukiraga. This was, this was uh, much lower. This is like 3,000 foot elevation. We, uh, we came down from the Andes. We were driving along the coast for a while, checking out, you know, the copiapoas, all those cool coastal cacti that uh, are basically get all their moisture from fog. You can see some in the background right there. And um, decided to hike up this this hill that we stopped at. Uh, it was in the middle of nowhere. It was the only hill around, so it was acting like a little sky island, and it had tons of endemics on it. We figured that out after we came down. Um, it's, a, it's basically like its own little biosphere uh, reserve up there. And this was growing up there. Another species of Chukiaraga, one of those weird ancient sunflowers. The Pacific Ocean was about a half mile away. So it's like the equivalent of Big Sur right here, but much foggier. So then coming down from there and going inland a little bit, now we're you know at about the latitude of Santiago. We started going inland. This is at that... Uh, uh, Wax Palm Preserve, which was super dry. Their, you know, their whole area is kind of obscene. Chile has been in a drought for 10 years. Uh, and, uh, but the avocado orchards nearby are basically you know, taking all the water out of the aquifer and also from uh, rainwater off the Andes. So, but this thing was blooming. This uh, Lobelia polyphyla was blooming. It was leafless, but what an incredible flower. And that's about three or four inches across. And there's where it was grown with all the eulichnias, these intense, <laughs> really intense cacti. And I think one of the reasons these spines are so long is to help con fog condense. It's not just for defense, but a lot of these plants are completely dependent on fog, almost negligible rain. So then going inland, uh, this is east of Santiago, going inland and up. The whole Santiago area was, was really, you know, super dry, really boring in terms of what was going off. There wasn't much blooming at the time. So we started going up towards uh, the Argentinian border, high up, and uh, that's when, when stuff started getting really interesting. Here's a member of the carrot family, a shrub that was just dominant everywhere and flowering too, just 
abundant, flowering abundantly. Gymnophyton isatitic carpum. And you can see this is probably like, I don't know, five, 6,000 feet maybe. There's my friend Woody. You can see they got, <laughs> they got the nice netting to prevent rock falls. Really sketchy road, really steep, really windy. And there's the plant. APACA. Also in that family, Azarella ruizii, another species in that same genus that uh, the Ureta was in, the Azarella compacta. But this is, again, this is not up at 13,000 feet anymore. This is like 6,000, 7,000 feet. Okay, this is this one was odd. This is a genus in the passion flower family. This is Malus sherbia linear folia. Look at all the glands. Everything here had glands on it. Super sticky. Again, I'd assume uh, Dieter herbivory also helped collect fog. Beautiful plant, though. I would love to see this uh, being grown out more. And there's the habitat. We saw one of those Andean foxes right here. Um, pretty cool. Skyxanthus hookeri. So sky, this, this is the nightshade family Solanaceae, another heavily glandular plant. Uh, this here is an annual. Skyxanthus is another genus with a lot of a uh, lot of species in it in the Andes. Look at the glands. These little trichomes, each tip with a little bead of resin. This thing smelled like a kind of like a perfumey tar. If that's possible, if you can imagine that. This was a species of uh, Muticia. One of those, another one of those weird, I call them dinosaur sunflowers, really bizarre. Tropiolum polyphyllum. So same genus as the common garden nasturtium, which I kind of hate because uh, I've just been beaten over the head with it horticulturally here in California. But uh, that genus is really species rich. There's a lot of cool species in that genus. And here's one of them. Almost broke my ass trying to get this photo. Extremely sketchy uh, talus. This was like another 100 feet down. Not straight down, you know, you'd have a nice Homer Simpson bounce to you if you fell, but uh, you know, whatever. Look, there's the uh, petals, little paddle shaped petals, clawed petals. And then of course they got that nectar spur on them. We saw three or four different species of tropiolum. They're interestingly, they're in the brassicales, the mustard order, and they smell like it too. They've got that, the foliage has those, that weird secondary chemistry. Another species of chuk, chukiraga oppositifolia. You can see the habitat right there. I just, oh man. Covered in wool, covered in the spines. Keep going down the road. This road was, was actually pretty busy too. There was a lot of truckers. A lot of trucks on it, lots of truckers. And where you have truckers, of course, you have bottles full of trucker urine, just decorating the sides of the road uh, like ornaments on a Christmas tree. It was disgusting. I saw shit there. I saw bottles that had urine in them that was the color of, I don't know what these guys were drinking, but I, you know, if I knew them, I'd say you should go get your kidneys checked out because they were just all the high fruit, those corn syrup, and I don't know. That's what stands out for me, just a part of, you know, our, a part of a human civilization, you know? I tend to get a little observational about uh, the humans I experience too. Anyway, so moving on up, again, this is on these sketchy talus slopes. Look at this, Loisaceae, the Menzelia family, Loasa pallida. So I don't, we don't get any Loasas in North America, as far as I know, but they are abundant. The species, the very species rich in the Andes, and here's one of them. And you got those Velcro leaves too, those you know, leaves you can pull off and stick on your shirt, they'll stay there. But these things sting. These are a lot meaner than our Euchnids or our Menzelias or any of those members of this family we get in North America. But uh, really strange too with these, these stamens, abundant stamens, and they just kind of hang out in those, those, uh, those petals right there. Christ, are those even a petal? I don't know. I didn't, I didn't dissect one of these flowers, I should have, but really, really strange flower morphology here. A friend of mine studies these. And our monkey flowers, there's a wealth of Chilean monkey flower species, formerly Mimulus, now Erythranth, uh, Lutea. Uh, this thing was beautiful. 
I mean, it was growing right in this gushing stream right here. Just super abundant, super common. The landscape here, I mean, it's the, it's the fucking Andes, you know? I mean, it's one of the most magnificent landscapes in the world. Uh, you could see that calyx, that distinct calyx. I should have gotten seed of this too, because there was probably seed on it. These things are self-fertile. Most erythranth are self-fertile. The seeds are tiny, 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 but uh, a lot larger than most of our, uh, our monkey flowers in North America, which is odd. Another Chiophora, Chiophora coronata. No friendlier than the last Chiophora we saw. You can see those long peduncles, calyx, and those inflated balloon flowers with the multiple stamens. Not sure if they have staminodes too, but these things were fucking wild. Look at my filthy fingers right there from fondling all these damn flowers, getting all those, all those glandular plants there. You can see evidence of it right here. Get a little forensic. Now this was cool. This is a family. Oh, god damn! Uh, should but should be this should T should be a Y, um, but uh, Calisaraceae. So this is we don't get this family in North America, but it's sister to our sunflower family. I love sunflowers. Some of you might be bored by them. I love them. They're fucking everywhere. They're intensely ecologically successful. Uh, you know, after orchids are the most species rich plant family in the world. Twenty seven thousand species. So this is at ten thousand feet near the Argentinian border. Um, and near the tunnel, it you know goes through. Uh, and there was like a ski resort nearby that was not having a great year because I think climate change is you know there's, <laughs> there's not much snow on the Andes recently, as you could probably imagine. But here we go, Nastanthus scapigerus, and this is growing right near. There's some rosalite violets right over the side of this hill, which I'll show you in a minute. But uh, you can see the similarities with the, the composites with the sunflowers bunch of tiny individual florets grouped together in an involucre right there. A little cup to hold all the flowers like a, like a vase. Up close, five corolla lobes. And then it looks like the, the, I can't tell if the, I should have dissected this thing too, but I don't know what's going on, on the inside. If those are anther, fused anther too or what, but so much of this stuff was, uh, is understudied. Couldn't find much information online. Those look, those do look like uh, anthers. Anyway, so a lot of members of the Astoralis, the order, you know, do secondary pollen presentation. They rely on their basically their pistillate part to present the pollen and push it out, like lobelias or like some of the goudinias in Australia, etc. There's the individual floret. Nice up close money shot of that uh, involucre. Tons of oxalis too. Unfortunately, I didn't show you any of the other six or seven species that uh, we saw, but here's a really cool one, an alpine one growing at 10,500 feet coming up in the talus. Where does it root into the ground? I don't know. That's a good question. How do these plants come up? They have to germinate somewhere. How do they come up through all this talus? I don't know. Is there snow at some point? That's how they germinate. I don't know. Anyway, look, all oh, the wool. And then uh, the petal, the flowers are closed, but I mean, you can kind of tell it's an oxalis in there. The leaves are even, you know, kind of hard to tell. You got to look through all those trichomes. Another species of Azarel, the Azarela ruizii again, growing on the side of this mountain in full flower. There's the ovaries, those wings. And then here we go. This is where it gets really nice. Look at that. Look at that. Uh, Rosalite violets, man. I remember seeing pictures of these, God, a few decades ago, or a few uh, years ago, and wondering what the hell, you know, how are they? They're so different from the, the violas we get in North America. And why, how did they end up having this form? I mean, they look almost succulent, but uh, there they are. There's the habitat. You could see just super high uh, volcanics and, uh, and they just pop up, just look at almost like little aliens or corals or something. This is Viola antropopuria, volcanic rock with the phenocrysts in the background. I don't know how old that is, I don't know how old they live. And there's the individual flower. Look at that, that nice red margin on these leaves, cool texture to it. Looks like you got some little calli, some little studs. 
again, I should have dissected one of these flowers, but these things, it, it almost feels like sacrilege. These things are too pretty and rather rare. And you can see once they're done flowering, they just get these little nodding uh, flowers, these little nodding flower heads. And there's a bunch, and they, you can see they blend in really well too. Some of them do that phyto camouflage thing, just blending in with that volcanic talus. So ending off this day was Jabarosa coalescens from the Solanaceae. Again, 10,500 feet, forming a little map, but it's growing in this rocky talus. Get your five fused petals into a trumpet, but uh, relatively few hairs. So that night we slept in the parking lot of like a ski lodge or something. There wasn't, you know, there was nowhere, nowhere to go really. It's, it's so the terrain is so rough. You're just stuck in this little, you know, uh, canyon that the road is in. So we got, we, we woke up in a parking lot of this ski resort. There was like no one there. Took off, started walking along this lake and uh, instantly saw this Alstroemeria uh, andina, which wasn't blooming yet, but again, coming up through the talus, the color on this water was incredible too. Alpine Lake. Another uh, Adesmia. So another very species rich genus. That's again, look at the glands on this thing. Another really species rich genus uh, in this country is in the Andes was Adesmia, which is a fabid, it's a Faboidea subfamily. It's one of the peas. But it smelled like hell, it smelled like a moldy polyester bathing suit. All the adesmias I encountered smelled pretty bad. <laughs> it was, it was, I was impressed. Again, looks pretty boring here, but there's a ton of there was a ton of good stuff going on. So <clears throat> like this Junelia uniflora, verbenaceae. It's growing matted on the rocks. Those five fused verbena petals. And then uh, Pozoa coriacea in the carrot family growing on the, these volcanic sediments. You could tell there's, there was a glacier here at some point too. You could see that U-shape, the U-shaped valley right there. You could see the nectar on these uh, petals of that umbel. But again, this thing stayed pretty close to the ground too, kind of shield-shaped uh, leaves to it. Such a beautiful plant. Huh? I think there's two or three species of Pozoa in the Andes. One of the Senecios, don't know which one. There's tons of Senecios down there too. There's Senecios everywhere. Every, everywhere in the world I go, there's a native Senecio, it seems. But look at the, uh, before the flower heads open, before the capitula open, they've got that beautiful purple color with all those anthocyanin pigments. And there's that glacier carved valley with a couple horses, a couple feral horses in it, eating all the plants I wanted to see. Uh, like this, this stamp. Montiaceae, the bitterroot family, or Claytonia family. Tons of stamp in Chile too. I had a label for this, but I don't, I can't see it because of this, uh, you don't know, maybe I can minimize this. Ah, look at that. Look at those flowers. Such a weird coloration, looking like a, a bloodshot eye. Of course, that succulent blue foliage to it. Warnestanthus, Scapagirus, Calisteraceae, and another viola, Viola montagnii. Again, how does it, where is it rooted into the ground? Where does it root? It's just coming up with these giant boulders. And this thing was, of course, covered in tons of hispid hairs, those tiny flowers. What pollinates these? What, are, how, what do the insects look like to pollinate these things? The form on these is incredible. I know, uh, I know, I believe I know a woman who germinated a few of these and was able to grow them for a while uh, in the Bay Area. Ooh, should've, should've turned down the exposure on this photo, but you get the idea. Tiny flowers, flowers smaller than the leaves. Then those, those rosalate leaves, those leaf rows that's just covered in stiff little hairs. Oreastrum apiculatum, cool little uh, member of the daisy family, the mutisioid subfamily. Again, woolly as hell is coming up in the talus. And then to end it off, coming down, Mulgorea scoparia of the Verbenaceae, a, a leafless stem photosynthesizing uh, member of the verbena family. 
just <laughs> growing in this this high dry climate again it felt like uh felt like nevada almost so believe that's it so that's all i got for you so hopefully uh, you enjoyed that that was very good thank you can i ask a question yeah did you know all these obscure genera before you went to all these places? No, no, not at all. No, I would get I would get a checklist for each place. Uh, I could get most of these plants down uh, to family, if not genus. I mean, I researched it a little bit, but I mean, they're all, there's no way to really know what stuff is until you get out there. You know, I think I had a there. I had one or two books too that a, that a friend lent me. But, mm -hmm. um, but you know, the books would have like a couple, you know, there, there's no way they could get the entirety of the, the flora here. For the Dominican Republic, I didn't know anything. I mean, I, I went to their herbarium on my last day there and when one of the guys in their herbarium went through everything with me for like two hours, which is super helpful. But um, yeah, man, no, I mean, it's, you know, there's a lot of this stuff is under study or it's in places where there's no field guide. Like when, when I was in Western Australia, they had field guides which were cool. Um, you know, they really document their flora well, but like in the Dominican Republic, no, there was very little. 